Good morning, everybody. So we're going to pick back up on the topic of hybrid orbital theory. We're going to try to talk about how um, hybrid orbital theory can be used to try to understand um, sort of single bonding versus uh, double bonding and some trends we might be able to look at in terms of their orbitals. And so let's first think about the central atoms of CH2, CH2, so C2H4, um, that each of these carbon atoms has three domains. So three domains would be trigonal planar. And the question for like hybrid orbital theory kind of stems from valence bond theory, which is the idea that orbitals overlap to make bonds. And so if you have these carbon atoms where they have their usual orbitals, so the, the second row orbitals would be like a 2s orbital and then a 2p set of orbitals. And if you start to think about these 2p orbitals, you really don't get overlap with the 2p orbitals and their normal orbital form with those hydrogen atoms that are at 120 degree bond angles. So if the orbitals are at 90 degree bond angles, how do you get 90 degree bonds? The answer is you hybridize the orbitals. And so then you start thinking, well, if, if I have two hydrogens this way, coming straight in and out of the page, let's say, and then we have a p orbital that's straight up, and then we have p orbitals that are in this plane and in this plane. Don't we probably want to use, for the hydrogen sticking straight out, don't we want to use the p orbitals that are in their same plane? So if you start thinking about your p orbitals on carbon, what you might realize is if these hydrogens are going back and coming out at us, like let's take the p orbital that's going back sort of into the page, it's kind of hard to sketch, but let's imagine we have the p orbital going straight back and then coming straight out of the page. And then let's imagine the p orbital this way here. Let's hybridize those two p orbitals with the s because our sp2 gives us the right orientation of three orbitals. So if we have trigonal planar, we have three domains. So we need three orbitals. So we get three hybrid orbitals. There's only one 2s orbital on each carbon. So, and then there's three, up to three p orbitals. So we can get up to sp3 hybridization, but that's for tetrahedral. That's where we have four domains. So we had four domains, we go sp3. We have three domains here, so we go sp2. And then we leave behind a p orbital. So we leave behind a p orbital that's unhybridized. So we have that p orbital that's not part of that sp2 hybridization. And a molecule that we saw before that was trigonal planar last time, BF3, BF3 just didn't use this orbital. It was just like an empty orbital. But uh, C2H4 can use this orbital because we can have the other carbon right next door have an unhybridized p orbital as it also hybridizes the same sort of set of p orbitals coming straight in and out of the page, like into the page in parallel with the um, bond hybridized for the sp2 orbital. So both of the carbon atoms go sp2 and then the unhybridized p orbitals can overlap to make what we call a pi bond. And so the orbitals, you might see them a little bit better um, where they're sketched out from the textbook. So you get this orbital here where you get like a planar type bond and that the electrons are being distributed across a plane instead of a bond axis. And so we call this type of bond here a pi bond. And that's just like one of the two bonds in the C, the carbon-carbon double bond. The carbon-carbon single bond is just the overlap between those sp2 orbitals. So the sp2, sp2 overlap is just an ordinary sigma bond. So you get these hybrid orbitals here. So these are our three sp2 orbitals on each of the carbons. And then they overlap to make what we call a sigma bond. A sigma bond is just like a single bond. So you think of the Greek letter sigma for S, you get this like sigma type single bond. So when we look at a molecule like C double bond C bonded to the four hydrogens, we can sort of break this down and see that, okay, each of these sing single bonds here is a sigma. So I have the four sigma from those sigma bonds, from those single bonds between the CH bonds. And then the double bond is a sigma plus a pi. So we get the sigma overlap and we get the pi overlap. So for C2H4, we'd have four plus another sigma and then plus a pi. So we'd have five sigma bonds in the molecule and then a pi bond. 
so double bonding is sort of a, um, a single bond and then a planar type pi bond. And so it's important to recognize that a double bond isn't two pi bonds, but it's a sigma bond. So sigma um, sp2, sp2 overlap on the bond axis. The second bond is that planar type pi bond. And so what hybrid orbital theory allows us to do is to understand the pi bonding that goes on in double bonded molecules as being the result of sigma bonding for half of the bond. So for one of the bonds being sigma and the other bond being a planar type pi bond. Now let's look at C2H2. So C2H2 is acetylene. Um, so acetylene in terms of a formula would be C triple bond to each other. So we have a triple bond between the carbon atoms. And so in this molecule here, we're looking at each of the two carbons as being linear because they have two domains. Each two domains, like CO2, goes linear. So each of these two carbon atoms perfectly linear in their geometries. And so to go perfectly linear, the, the issue would be one orbital should overlap with one other atom. And so the issue with this molecule is I have like two different orbitals that we want to mix together and then hybridize. So I take the S and the P, hybridize those, and then I come up with two different orbitals, one that looks like one SP orbital, the other looks like the other SP orbital. Then we do this to the other carbon as well. So it goes SP hybridized. So we use SP hybridization. So if we use SP hybridization, we get our two SP orbitals, then we get our SP1S overlap. So of course the, the hydrogen bonds, when we have a hydrogen atom pair up with the um, SP bond, that's a sigma. So if I'm counting my bond types here, I would have these two bonds here, are sigma bonds. They're resulting from 1S SP overlap. And then if we have um, SP hybridization, then we've left behind two of the P orbitals that aren't hybridized. And so I have a P orbital here on each of those carbon atoms. Then I have another P orbital. Again, they're sketch. If you can sketch it and see it, and then you can see it in a picture like here, then I think we can make sense of this pretty easily that we're just simply overlapping those pi bonds. So we overlap one of the pi bonds for one of the, the two extra bonds between the two carbon atoms, and then we do it again for those orbitals sticking straight out of the page. So our triple bond, we still get the sigma-sigma overlap. We still get the sp-sp overlap. So we still get a sigma, and then we get two pi bonds. And so we get this sp-sp overlap for the sigma. And then the two pi bonds are from the unhybridized p orbitals. So the overlapping of those p orbitals in that planar sense is how we get a different type of bond that emerges for triple bonds. So anytime we see a double bond, we're going to be thinking, OK, it's probably a sigma and a pi. And we see a triple bond, we're going to think that it's a sigma and two pi bonds. And so we still have electrons being traded. And you can also think about how we have electrons here. Electrons repel each other. So if we already have two electrons between the, the axis of the two carbon atoms, then we have to start using the space around the carbon atoms out in front and on top and bottom. And so the planar bonds are just a way that carbon's best using space around it. So the electrons, which repel each other, stay out of each other's way. So it's just a way that these molecules are best using their space. And so when we look at the bonding in, say, hydrogen, H2, we're just thinking, OK, how do we get overlap is kind of the question. For hydrogen, we don't need to hybridize. We don't need to change orbitals. We just have simple 1s, 1s overlap to make a sigma bond. C2H2, we see that we have the sp2, sp2 overlap for the sigma. And then the pi bond is our p, p overlap. So the overlapping of those unhybridized p orbitals. So sigma bonding, if you think of the nuclei of the atom, it's symmetrical about the bond axis. So I like to think of S as like bond axis symmetric. And then planar, like pi is the Greek letter P. Um, so it's like a planar type bond. 
so it's a planar bond. It's like a linear bond versus a planar bond. Nitrogen, nitrogen, we can even think too within this bonding model that we would have sp hybridization for each of these as well. So we have an sp orbital overlapping. Another sp orbital contains the lone pair electrons on each of the ends. And then we have our unhybridized p orbitals sticking straight up. And then end of the page, so our NN triple bond is uh, the sigma bond still, and then two pi bonds. A type of question you'll see that will be like, okay, if you have, say, this Lewis structure here, for like this Lewis structure, how many sigma and pi bonds are there? And it's actually a pretty easy question, because it's really just looking at our single bonds. So we just look at the single ones first. So all of our single bonds are just sigma bonds. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sigma bonds from the single bonds. Then if I start looking at my double and triple bonds, here I would have the sigma plus the pi. And then for my triple bond, I'd have a sigma plus two pi. So in total, I'd have eight plus nine plus 10, I'd have 10 sigma bonds, and then I'd have three pi bonds in this molecule in total. So we can count up and just picture double bonding. And this kind of gets into, like if we want to think atom by atom, we can. You know, like we can look at this first carbon here. Oh, I wrote my S backwards. That would be sp2. <laughs> Twice I've written it backwards. sp2. So that carbon would be sp2 hybridized. And then the carbons that have four, so like look at this carbon here, it has one, two, three, four domains. So that's tetrahedral. That's sp3 hybridization. We have the same for the carbon next door to it. Also sp3 hybridization. What that means is just kind of picturing if something's tetrahedral, goes sp3 hybridization, we need to hybridize all the p orbitals. If we have sp3 hybridization, there's no room for double bonds. Like we can't have sp3, SP3 hybridization and double bonding taking place within hybrid orbital theory. And then we'd have sp hybridization for carbon and nitrogen. And then lastly, I didn't write the electron pairs on oxygen, but we might be looking at this oxygen and calling it sp2 because it has three domains. It has two lone pairs in that bonding domain. And so it's really just making sure that we see each bond, like a double bond is still just one bonding domain. And then for oxygen, the lone pair, the two sets of lone pairs are its other two domains. So sp2, trigonal planar geometry. So hybrid orbital theory really just goes hand in hand with molecular geometries and electron domain geometries. So linear goes sp, trigonal planar goes sp2, tetrahedral goes sp3. But what we gain from hybrid orbital theory is a picture for what the orbitals are doing in these molecules and a picture of what pi bonding looks like. That pi bonding is putting more electrons when we see like a double bond. It's not putting four electrons here, it's putting two electrons here and then another two electrons sort of centering around that bond. Okay, so that's kind of what we just said, our summary of sp for linear, sp2 for trigonal planar, sp3 for tetrahedral. But the key is just once you get to sp2 or sp, you can have double bonding or triple bonding take place. You obviously can't have triple bonds within sp2 because we need that second pi, that second p orbital to be unhybridized. So we can have triple bonding within sp, double bonding within sp2, and only single bonding within sp3. Now, if you're in sp, like if you go to CO2, you can still have double bonds within sp. So CO2 would have an sp hybridized central atom. So we get those domains 180 degrees relative to each other. And then we have p orbitals left over to hybridize with the oxygens. And so then we have sort of two pi bonds that would emerge for CO2. So the two pi bonds for the two double bonds. So if we're looking at CO2, we'd say it has two sigma bonds and two pi bonds. 
let's look at, we looked at this picture back in chapter eight, let's look at it here in chapter nine. So for um, um, our residents, like we, it might be confusing why when we look at nitrate, why it is that we're trying to really reinforce the message that for nitrate, even though we can sketch this Lewis structure here, that the real molecule never exists as this Lewis structure. It's always the composite with its other two resonance structures where one of them is this structure, where we move these electrons to here, and then the other resonance structure is where we move the electrons to the other um, nitrogen-oxygen double bond. So then on average, if you remember for nitrate, we'd say nitrate has a four-thirds bond across all three of those NO bonds, and they're all equivalent. Orbital theory, hybrid orbital theory, gives us a picture of how this works in the real molecule. So if you picture one of those resonance structures, the localized bonding would look like, okay, we'd have a double bond between one of the nitrogens and oxygen atoms, and then we'd have single bonds with the other. If you notice that the sort of vertical or the p orbital sticking straight out of the page is where we get the planar bond. Well, if you notice that if each of the oxygen goes sp2 and they're bonding, they each would have a p orbital sticking straight out of the page. And so if all four atoms have a p orbital that are possible to overlap simultaneously, then they can overlap all at the same time. So there is just one orbital across all four of those atoms that holds those extra two electrons at any given moment. So this is how those electrons are delocalizing, spreading across those three bonds simultaneously. So we have two electrons in a pi bond that are spread across four atoms simultaneously. And so that's the idea of resonance. So resonance is how the electrons resonating like resonating is maybe thinking of it being at all those locations at the same time, and it can do that through this one um, orbital that we can sketch. And so this sketch here is that delocalization. So this is like what the orbital picture looks like for the structure that we might write like this. So when we write this, that we can kind of picture an orbital that looks like this. And so then delocalized bonding is just the nature of the orbital interactions in these molecules that we can understand from hybrid orbital theory. Another molecule that does this is benzene. So benzene is an organic molecule, has carbon atoms, something you'll learn, um, and some of you may have seen some OCHEM in high school chemistry. But in organic chemistry, um, you use like a wedge and arrow kind of deal where anytime you have like a vertex, you assume that it's a carbon atom and then you assume that there's enough hydrogens to give carbon four bonds. And so if I were to write this structure up top, then this would have to be just ordinary butane, because I'd have to have three hydrogens here. Without sketching them, I'd have to have an H here and here. Here's an H, there's an H. So if I draw this, this would equal C4H10. Now, OCHEM will take off and run with this more than we will here. This is just to kind of show you the wedge and arrow for benzene, is that we have a carbon in each of those vertexes, and then we have a double bond and a single, so I need a hydrogen for each of those. So benzene has the formula, six hydrogens, uh, uh, six carbons and six hydrogens. So C6, C6, H6. Okay, now given that we can now maybe sort of picture what this molecule of benzene looks like, let's go back and erase all this here so we can more easily just look at the double bonding, in that all these double bonds could have been written over here as this structure. And then as soon as I sketch that structure, I can see that I have two different Lewis structures that are different from each other, yet they're equivalent. That's the idea of resonance, is whenever we can sketch equivalent yet different Lewis structures, then we know we have the concept of resonance that's gonna take place in these molecules. And then what I might write is, you know, instead of picturing it being double here or double here, is it's going to be sort of a, and I would actually prefer to write it for the first time more like this, to kind of be consistent with the way we wrote it for nitrate. As if I write it with the dash, I think what you can see is that we're sort of spreading a double versus single and averaging those out. 
If we average those out, each of those bonds should be a three halves bond. Now, how can you also count three halves bonding? Might be if you just took note of there being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine total bonding pairs of electrons. So I just counted all like the single and double bonds across benzene. So three double bonds would be six. Three single bonds would be another three. So that's nine total bonding pairs of electron. And we're spreading those nine bonding pairs across one, two, three, four, five, six carbon-carbon bonds. And so that's another way where we're getting three halves bond order. So again, three halves bond order, kind of halfway between what you'd expect for single bond versus double bond. Um, so if you're asked the question of like the bonding in benzene, do you think that a real molecule of benzene will have three short bonds and three longer carbon-carbon bonds? No, because it's going to be delocalized. It's going to have three equal bonds. And those bond lengths should be a little bit uh, longer than a normal double bond and a little bit shorter than a single bond. And so like a carbon-carbon single bond is about one point, I think it's about 1.5 angstrom. Carbon-carbon double bond is about 1.2 angstrom. And the bond in benzene, we'd expect to be about 1.35 angstrom, kind of right in the middle. Okay, and so the picture, though, that we get, like the way that benzene delocalizes those electrons, if you start thinking about the p orbital overlapping like a planar bond, all those orbitals sticking straight out of the page, and then we flip over to the other delocalized structure, which has the same type of orbital sticking straight out of the page. What if you get simultaneous overlap? So what if we have one orbital that happens to take those three extra double bonds simultaneously? So we have that one orbital take those three electrons at the same time. So we have um, an overlapping take place. We're putting six pi electrons across those six carbon-carbon um, bonds. So we get six pi electrons delocalized in that what we sometimes call a pi system. So benzene here would have six electrons in that pi system. And it's the, you know, the six electrons that make up those double bonds that are then spreading across those atoms simultaneously. If we think back of nitrate on the previous slide, I don't want to, flipping back slide screws the video up. But here we're picturing having these two electrons here, so two, and then these two electrons move, so that's four, and then we move these two electrons in here, so that's six. So nitrate also has six pi electrons, or six uh, pi system electrons. And so we're spreading those electrons across the three bonds in nitrate. Um, we're spreading the six pi system electrons in benzene across those bonds as well. OK, so hybrid orbital theory gives you a picture for how this bonding can take place through the overlapping of the p orbitals. Um, if we think about benzene, how would we characterize the sigma bonding? So like if you notice, like the little gray, the, excuse me, the purple, is the sigma overlap. What would you call the sigma bonds for those carbon-carbon bonds? So if we're counting up the bonding in benzene, so let me resketch a benzene here, just one of the resonance structures. So if I'm counting the bonding in benzene, let's include the hydrogens. Let's do two things. Let's ask how many sigma bonds are there in the molecule and how many pi bonds are there. And so I hope we can agree really easily that there's three pi bonds because the doubles are the sigma plus pi. So I get three pi bonds from the double bonds. I get three sigma bonds from those bonds as well. And then I get sigma bonding here. So I get six sigma bonds for all the carbon-carbon bonds across the molecule. So I would have one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I get the sigma bonds for the CH bonds. So I get 12 sigma bonds. So I get the six CH sigmas and then the six CC single bonds from the sigma overlap. And then if I were to ask, 
well, what does this overlap do to the carbon hydrogen bonds versus what is the overlap between the carbon carbon bonds to make up the sigma bonds? The carbon carbon sigmas, all those carbons are sp2 because each of the carbons has three bonding domains. And so trigonal planar, so this is sp2, why'd I go to that pen? sp2, sp2 overlap. And then the carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon still sp2 hybridized, so the carbon's sp2, and then hydrogen 1s. So we have the overlap between the 1s sp2. So if we're thinking of one of these carbons, that it would be sp2, and then hydrogen can overlap for a 1s sp2, then another carbon can overlap with the sp2 sp2 overlap to make up the sigma bond. So we get sigma bonding and pi bonding in C6A6, ah, C6H6, just like we do other molecules. So the double bonds, sigma and a pi, and then the singles are just the sigma overlap. Yeah, so the, um, when you picture the resonating electrons, it's like how many electrons are resonating? So when you, um, I might have to erase a little bit. So when you picture these electrons moving to here, and let me do another thing, let me make it bigger. So if we move these electrons here, these electrons here, and these electrons here, like how many electrons are moving in total? And so that would be six. So uh, uh, like a lone pair, so what does a lone pair do? It mostly depends on the molecule, but mostly they're gonna be in hybrid orbitals if we're thinking hybrid orbital theory. Um, so if we think of, um, let me go to this slide here. So if we just go to kind of a molecule like we had earlier, like if we're picturing this molecule here, I would say that these two electrons here are in sp2 orbitals. And then we have our sp2, sp2 overlap here. And then we have our sp2, sp3 overlap with the hydrogen. So you can kind of go like 1s, sp2 overlap here. And then the um, um, electrons being in hybrid orbitals. Um, so if we sketch this out here, let me put the three hydrogens. So in terms of sigma and pi, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six sigma, and just the one pi. And then in terms of overlap, we'd have sp3 about this carbon here, and then sp2 about that carbon here. So like sp2, sp3, sp2, 1s with the hydrogen, sp2, sp2 with the oxygen, and then sp3, 1s with the hydrogens. Yeah. If you think of like nitrogen, nitrogen, sp overlap, and these electrons here in an sp orbital. Okay, now we would almost be done with this chapter, but there's an interesting story of oxygen. I think that leads us into a discussion we're going to get into here on another theory of bonding called molecular orbital theory. And in some ways, molecular orbital theory can reinforce some valence bond pictures that we had before, um, because some of the bonding type pictures we get are very similar. Um, so for hydrogen, we, we pictured hydrogen before. If we're missing the Edwin question that other students have, anybody have any questions on anything before we move on? <laughs> Edwin will appreciate the shout out. <laughs> Yeah, so the, um, when you picture the resonating electrons, it's like how many electrons are resonating? So when you, um, I might have to erase a little bit. So when you picture these electrons moving to here, and let me do another thing, let me make it bigger. So if we move these electrons here, these electrons here, and these electrons here, like how many electrons are moving in total? And so that would be six. So uh, uh, like a lone pair, so what does a lone pair do? It mostly depends on the molecule, but mostly they're gonna be in hybrid orbitals if we're thinking hybrid orbital theory. 
Um, so if we think of, um, let me, okay. Um, so getting back to, to hydrogen here. So we, like the valence bond picture looked like this, if you remember, where we brought the hydrogens together, we made a stable bond. If we go too far, the nuclei repel. Well, molecular orbital theory has a very similar um, sort of picture for overlap in that anytime we bring like orbitals together, we can get like a bonding, but then we also get an anti-bonding combination for those orbitals. And so something we gain from MO theory is seeing that, yeah, we can have two electrons go into like a bonding orbital as those orbitals overlap. And then if we wanted to try to put more electrons in the molecule, which H2 doesn't do in a stable way, but if we wanted to try to do that, it wouldn't be stable to add more electrons because they'd be going into uh, what's called an anti-bonding orbital. So we get a bonding orbital and we get an anti-bonding orbital. So the anti-bonding orbital kind of has a node in the middle of the two nuclei, meaning that there's no probability of finding the electrons um, sort of in the um, area between the atoms. The greatest probability is far away. And so the bonding orbitals try to bring the nuclei together. So if you think of the dots as being the nuclei, we have electrons bringing the nuclei together. The anti-bonding orbitals are kind of doing the opposite. They're trying to break the bond that we just made. So H2, we look at H2 and say that what we've done for hydrogen is we've made um, a single bond. How do we know we have a single bond? Well, of course, from the Lewis structure, you would have a single bond. But then from the MO picture, you'd have two electrons in a bonding orbital. So if you take the number of bonding electrons and subtract the number of anti-bonding electrons, that that would be the net number of bonding electrons in the molecule. And then we usually think of bonds as being, you know, like if we just do that for hydrogen, it's two minus zero. So we have two bonding electrons. We want to cut that in half for the bond order. So we multiply this by one half, gives us our bond order. So where a bond order of one is a single bond sharing two electrons. So if we're counting electrons that are being shared between the atoms, we have two bonding electrons for hydrogen minus zero anti-bonding times a half gives us a bond order of one, which is a single bond. So we get the same picture for hydrogen as we do valence bond theory as we do from the Lewis structure. Uh, but then you maybe get a picture for why something like H2 two minus wouldn't exist as a stable molecule. If we try to put two more electrons in, we'd be putting those electrons in our anti-bonding orbital here. Um, in terms of an MO diagram, it might look like this, where we have our two 1s orbitals. We get bonding going down in terms of energy. We get anti-bonding going up. This is our sigma 1s star, our sigma 1s. For H2, 2 minus, we'd have two electrons in our bonding and then two electrons in the anti-bonding orbital. And then the net bond order here would be zero. So if you think of our bond order for H2, 2 minus, it would be equal to a half, two minus two. So that means that there can be no bond that forms in a stable way between two hydrogens with the two minus charge. Again, not surprising, but it gives you a picture that you get from this theory that you may not get from valence bond theory. Valence bond theory may not be able to tell you why H2, two minus doesn't exist. Now, if you also go back to something like a different molecule, if you go back to valence bond theory and just think overlapping of orbitals, if orbitals can overlap, we make bonds. What about two helium atoms? So can two helium atoms overlap and make a bond? So for dihelium, does this exist with like a single bond? Probably not because we've never seen this before. Helium's a noble gas. Noble gases tend not to form bonds with other things, probably not itself. And then H2, 2 minus would also be the same model for helium 2. Helium 2 and H2, 2 minus, they don't equal each other, but they have the same electron configurations. They each have four electrons. So if I tried to put four electrons in for helium 2, I'd come up with the same bond order of zero. So helium 2 is not going to exist as a diatomic molecule. because the bond order would equal zero, that means there's no bond that can form between two helium atoms. Now, there's a strange concept, like you can make like helium two, if you kick an electron off, you can actually make a stable bond enough for it to exist for like helium two with a plus charge. So helium two with a plus charge now has three electrons, 
this would have a bond order if we kick an electron off of here this would have a bond order that's a half times two bonding electrons minus one anti-bonding electron so we'd have a bond order of half not great this isn't something you're gonna bottle and pair up with like chloride ion and ship across the country, but you can make helium-2 in some type of experiments where it exists for a short amount of time enough to characterize some of its properties. But the point of the matter is really that the MO theory kind of gives you a picture for why H2 exists with the single bond that reinforces what we know from valence bond theory. Then if we're thinking helium, 1s orbital, why can't the 1s orbitals overlap for helium? The answer is the extra two electrons would go into a bonding versus anti-bonding orbital, canceling out each other and making no bond that can form between the two atoms. So helium-2 wouldn't exist. And then, of course, we can make goofy ions of these things, which isn't really the point. But you can sort of see that some ions of like helium could be stable enough to exist and observe. OK, so that's good and all. Now, um, helium, uh, hydrogen versus helium-2. So again, we get a single bond for hydrogen, a bond order of 0 for um, helium-2. If helium-2 would exist, we'd give it like, kind of like a um, electron configuration. We could give the MO configuration for like a sigma 1s2, sigma star 1s2. So you can sort of picture how many electrons are in each of these orbitals. Again, our bond order would be zero though, and that this molecule wouldn't exist as a stable molecule. So one of the things that's really, I think, driving why we have this topic in our chapter is a really interesting property of oxygen that we wouldn't have predicted with any of our bonding models so far. If you're looking at oxygen as you know, a Lewis structure, we'd have this Lewis structure here. Um, if we're thinking of where these electrons are within hybrid orbital theory, we might be thinking they're in sp2 orbitals. And we might be thinking, OK, we have you know, like a pi orbital. We have a sigma orbital for O2. The question I would have is, does O2 have any unpaired electrons in any bonding model we've seen so far? And I think the answer would be no, in a sense that sp2 like, would be an orbital with spin paired electrons. So when we picture nitrogen, we're thinking nitrogen in, in the model we were talking earlier, that these electrons would be spin paired. And that they're probably spin paired. If they're in an orbital together, it should just be like, one up, one down, just like any other orbital has two electrons in it. And so wouldn't oxygen be the same? So wouldn't you expect oxygen to be something that has zero unpaired electrons? Well, if you take oxygen and you flow it through a magnet, it actually sticks in the magnetic field. And that means oxygen is what we call uh, paramagnetic. So oxygen actually has at least one unpaired electron. Since it has an even count of electrons, it can't just have one unpaired electron. It's going to have to have at least two just by its electron count. So paramagnetic, uh, paramagnetic molecules have at least one unpaired electron. Oxygen, therefore, at least has to have two unpaired electrons. And so the question we have is, well, let's come up with a bonding model that shows us oxygen having unpaired electrons so we can understand why it has unpaired electrons so that we can sort of get this picture here of oxygen somehow having these like spin paired electrons. So oxygen spin paired electrons, how do we get this within a bonding model? So, um, Let's just progress and get towards O2. So let's start with lithium-2 and beryllium-2 and just kind of start thinking of how, if we get across the second row towards O2, what the bonding might look like. So if we look at the bonding in dilithium, the difference between dilithium and dihydrogen doesn't seem like much, other than hydrogen's a gas and lithium's a solid. But lithium-2 is a molecule. We're just thinking, can lithium-2 as a diatomic molecule exist? And I think it can, because we'd have each of the lithiums with their electron configurations, 1s2, 2s1. Energy is going upward. The 2s orbital is higher in energy, bigger orbital. So same thing with the other lithium, 1s2, 2s1. And then we can get the same bonding and antibonding contribution. Now, the 1s orbitals, if you're picturing two lithiums, it's like you have small 1s orbital, bigger 2s orbital. And so the 2s orbitals of lithium are probably going to be able to better interact with each other because they're bigger and they can overlap better. So we're going to get a bigger bonding and anti-bonding contribution for the 2s orbitals. And I think this is actually you know, too big, that it should be not much bonding and anti-bonding for the valence, or excuse me, for the core orbitals. So the core orbitals don't really interact too much. I think this picture is showing it to be even bigger than what it really is. So just a small bonding and anti-bonding contribution. So small bonding going down, anti-bonding going up. 
Um, and then we get the bonding, anti-bonding for lithium-2. But the good thing for lithium-2 is that we're only putting six electrons in for lithium-2. So two, four, six electrons in to each of those three orbitals. So each orbital takes two electrons max, just like before, just like the Pauli exclusion principle and um, electron configuration orbitals from chapter six. So two electrons per orbital, so we end up with a net bond order of one. So if we think of our bond order here for lithium two, we'd have a half times four bonding electrons and then minus two anti-bonding electrons, giving us that bond order of one which makes sense, I think, because you're just pairing up those valence electrons for a single bond. Okay, and then you can contrast this with like beryllium-2. Beryllium-2 is gonna look a lot like helium. I thought I had a slide on it. So for beryllium-2, if you just go to the next element over for di-beryllium, it would be, you know, what type of bond exists between beryllium? Well, beryllium has to put eight electrons in. So beryllium has four electrons each, and so beryllium has to put two electrons in that sigma star 1s, kicking it into having a bond order of zero. So beryllium-2 doesn't really form a stable bond in a diatomic molecule because the bond order would be a half, four minus four. Four bonding electrons, four anti-bonding electrons for no bond. So as a diatomic molecule, we wouldn't expect diberyllium to be stable. We'd expect lithium-2 to be stable and form with a single bond. Okay, now we're really just talking about lithium and beryllium to kind of then start to think about oxygen and so, um, um, and the other um, diatomic molecules across the second row of the periodic table. And so let's think about our p orbitals for a moment. So we have sort of each of the um, atoms, if we're picturing, you know, a carbon or two oxygens that are going to overlap with each other, let's picture two oxygens and start thinking about how they have p orbitals that look like this. We have p orbitals that also look like this. And then they have the p orbitals sticking straight out of the page. I'm going to leave that one off my sketch. But you can imagine that one, sometimes this is confusing. We can't just pick these orbital, orbitals up and move them. Like these orbitals are kind of locked in place. We can maybe hybridize them, but they're still going to be centered around their nuclei. Like if I hybridize orbitals, I still keep them centered around their nuclei. I'm not changing their center. Sometimes I get a question of like, why doesn't this orbital here like, why doesn't this just move up here? It's like, we can't move the orbital to be centered around anything other than the nuclei, nuclei of that atom. But then we have a different nature of this overlap, sigma overlap, than the pi overlap. So the p orbitals on these atoms can overlap in that sigma direction, and they can overlap in the pi direction. And then the p orbital I didn't sketch would also overlap in a pi sense, in a planar way. So we can get p orbital overlap, but we get bonding and anti-bonding. And then the p orbital's vertical can go bonding and anti-bonding as well. So we can bring the nuclei together. We can then separate them and break those bonds with their anti-bonding orbitals. Okay, so then if we start to picture a given atom has its 2s and 2p orbitals, and that those orbitals can simultaneously overlap with each other, it's just kind of like a lock and key mechanism where you're sort of picturing an atom that has a 2s a 2p set of orbitals that looks something like this, overlapping and, and encountering another atom that has those same set of orbitals as each other. And so the 2s orbitals can overlap with each other, the 2p orbitals can overlap with each other, and then these 2p orbitals can overlap with each other. And so the difference is the 2s just start lower in energy because they're just more stable, closer to the nuclei, so they're smaller orbitals, so they're lower in energy. And then, so they get their bonding and anti-bonding. We're also neglecting the valence orbital, or excuse me, we're neglecting the 1s core orbital because it doesn't really participate much in bonding. So we're just going to neglect the 1s orbitals. So we're just looking at the valence shell orbitals interacting. So I get bonding. So notice I get a sigma uh, 2s and a sigma star 2s, so bonding and anti-bonding for the 2s. Then I get the sigma bonding orbital. So I get a sigma 2p, sigma star 2p, then I get the pi. So I get pi, and there's two of the pi's, because there's two p orbitals that are exactly equivalent with each other. Sometimes we say that's degenerate. So we get two degenerate pi orbitals. So I get two pi bonding orbitals that go down, and I get two pi bonding orbitals that go up. So the stars go up in energy relative to their starting orbitals, and then the bonding orbitals go down. So I said the bonding orbitals go down, 
and the stars go out. Okay, now let's take a look at her. Um, what this is showing us is these orbitals as we go from left to right across the dilithium to dibrillium, et cetera. So let's just also picture our electron counts. So we're taking our electron counts for our valence electrons. So our valence electron count for dilithium would actually be two, not four. So we'd have two valence electrons, one for each of the lithiums. And so this is showing us our sigma 2s, sigma star 2s. Notice we're neglecting the core orbitals. We're not showing the sigma 1s orbitals. And so we see the sigma 1s, so two electrons in for lithium goes here. Dibrillium, four electrons. We go to this structure here. We showed this earlier. That's one that has a bond order of zero. So we can sort of calculate each step of the way. What's the bond order? So no bond for dibrillium. Now, let's look at boron. Notice that boron goes to now having six electrons. In fact, the electrons are just double, they're not doubling, two more for each time. So we can write those in, because we're just going in order from left to right. So boron's putting six electrons in, and then I have to follow Hund's rule and spin pair of those electrons and use both orbitals, maximize the use of space. So diboron's a peculiar molecule in that it's bond order, I got bonding, anti-bonding, and then these are pi bonding orbitals. So these are bonding orbitals. This is that anti-bonding orbital. So the bond order for B2 is back to one. So the bond order here would be a half, four bonding minus two anti-bonding. Gives us that bond order of one. Okay, now something that's weird, notice how the pi electrons are almost the same energy, and then Look at how the sigma bond is actually changing in its relative energy compared to the pi sense. And so then when we go to eight for C2, we're going two, four, six, eight electrons. So C2, a peculiar molecule from our MO picture, but our net bond order here is going to be two because we have a half and I have two, six bonding electrons minus the two anti-bonding electrons. It's a weird molecule in that its double bond is actually two pi bonds. So if we're picturing C2, very peculiar molecule, but the MO picture is showing us that we have something that looks like this, but where this is actually two pi bonds instead of a sigma plus a pi. But that's just coming from this refined picture and that we're getting two planar type bonds holding those electrons. So um, no electrons between the carbon atoms, the electrons circling the periphery of the molecule. N2 starts to look like a molecule we expect it to look like um, in this MO picture. For nitrogen, we'd be putting 10 electrons in, so two, four, six, eight, and then 10. And so the reason why this looks like the molecule we expect is think about the bond order. We get a triple bond, because we're one half. We have all these electrons bonding, except for the sigma star 2s. So I have eight bonding electrons minus two anti-bonding, giving me that bond order of three, which is exactly what we expect for nitrogen to have a triple bond. And then we also start to get to a picture of like bonding and anti-bonding kind of results in lone pairs. That like the, the extra four electrons in nitrogen, like the two bonding, anti-bonding, average out to lone pairs. And so what these kind of look like in a molecule are just like lone pair electrons. So when we have the bonding, anti-bonding being canceled out, the net result is kind of those look like lone pair electrons. And then uh, for oxygen, 12 electrons, two, four. Notice that the sigma 2p has gone lower in energy than the pi 2p by a little bit. But if we're counting our electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, I gotta do 12 electrons, and there you see it, oxygen's paramagnetic. So oxygen ends up putting two electrons into an anti-bonding orbital. Now you might be wondering, well, why isn't O2 two plus more stable? If I kick those electrons off, then I have a triple bond, seems like that would be better, but that's too much charge. Oxygen needs those electrons to keep its charge in balance, and it has to put those electrons into an anti-bonding orbital, and then these have to be spin paired. So I didn't classify B2, B2 does this as well, that B2 and O2 are paramagnetic. meaning that they have unpaired electrons. And then the molecules that don't, like lithium-2, C2, 
N2 so far that these molecules here are diamagnetic. So diamagnetism is actually a weak repulsion of a magnetic field. I think a better way to think of paramagnetism is a paramagnetic molecule will be pulled into a magnetic field and a diamagnetic wouldn't be pulled into a magnetic field. And even if it's weakly repelled, I wouldn't get too worked up about that. That's just the electrons repelling the magnetic field and the molecule when their electrons are all spin paired. So diamagnetic for all spin paired. So this just means all electrons are spin paired. And then paramagnetic is at least one unpaired electron. Let's try, so the bond order of oxygen real quick would be two. How do I get a bond order of two for oxygen? Well, we now have two, four antibonding electrons. So from MO theory, the most bonding electrons you can ever get is eight, because there's only eight maximum bonding electrons in this picture. And then here we have four antibonding electrons. I'll circle them in red. So these are the antibonding electrons. So they're just in orbitals that have the star symbol. Okay, and so bond order of two. So oxygen still has a double bond. So that picture, that model was right from our bonding models. And then in terms of the Lewis structure for oxygen, if I'm thinking like, what does oxygen look like? Like it's probably just where you can start to sort of picture these electrons as being spin paired. So that, such that we get two net electrons in the same direction. So it's just a weird molecule in the sense that those antibonding electrons result in a mismatch and those electron dots is not really being in electron orbitals that are spin paired. So two unpaired electrons for O2. F2, 14 electrons. So we go two, four, six, eight, 10. I counted around two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So we're putting two more electrons into the configuration that we had for O2. And then this has a bond order of one. So we're now one half, eight bonding, six antibonding. And so then neon two is the one that's not going to exist, not surprisingly, that if we go to neon two, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, bond order back to zero. So no bond between two neon atoms uh, can exist within MO theory. Okay, now let's try to summarize what it is that I want you guys to be able to pick up. One is that you can put the electrons in these orbitals and kind of come up with the right bond orders for one versus two versus three for B2, C2 to N2, and then two to one to zero for O2, F2 to neon two. Uh, but notice that the only two orbitals that shift are these sigma two Ps and the pi two p's, that they just invert for O2, F2, and neon two due to their nature. Um, what we will do, this is just reminding us that diamagnetic, um, not drawn into a magnetic field, um, the result of having all electrons been paired, paramagnetic, the result of having one or more unpaired electrons, and that O2 is paramagnetic from the MO picture. And that, that's really what we were hoping, I think, to see from MO theories that oxygen are magnetic. Now, from this picture here, you might think, well, what of this do I have to remember? Well, if you notice that it, it's just these orbitals here that are changing relative to these orbitals. So what we give you on exam are models that look like this. So we'll give you these pictures on an exam, these um, base diagrams. Now, you just have to be able to mark them up and understand what they mean, that this is the 2s orbitals and the 2p orbitals, that we get this sigma 2s, sigma star 2s from the 2s orbitals overlapping. And then for B2, C2, N2, the pi 2p come next, then the sigma 2p, then the pi star, the antibonding 2p, then the sigma star 2p. And we're just really using the fact that the two have to be the pi because they're doubly degenerate. They have two orbitals that are exactly the same. And the sigma only have one orbital. There's one p orbitals pointing right at each other, two that are planar. And then for O2, F2, neon two, any ions of those molecules as well, go and just invert these orbitals here. So our sigma 2p comes first, then our pi 2p, then everything else is the same. 
And so a typical test question might just be for something like C2, 2 minus. Now for C2, 2 minus, we just go to the diagram for C2 and its ions. C2 has eight electrons, four for each carbon, plus two electrons for the charge. So I got to put 10 electrons into my base diagram. So two, four, six, eight, and then 10. So it looks just like N2's configuration. And so it looks like N2, my bond order half, eight bonding, only two anti-bonding, so I get a triple bond. And then all the electrons are spin paired. So that's diamagnetic. So we can predict bond lengths, or excuse me, we can predict bond orders. We can predict paramagnetic, diamagnetic better with MO theory. And we can also then like rank bond lengths. You'll see some questions that are like, should O2 or F2 be shorter in bond distance? O2 is a double bond, so it's gonna be shorter. F2 single bond's gonna be longer. So we come back to triple bonds, shorter than double bonds, shorter than single bonds in terms of length. I think that was just a question. Let me see. There's a couple more questions and a few review questions. I just want to point out that this, we'll get into these slide. I skipped over it because I kind of did these molecules or things like them last time. But so we'll look at some review questions from uh, chapters seven through nine, Monday and Wednesday. Next Wednesday's a test. Friday's a holiday. So enjoy the uh, day off on Friday, and I'll see you back here on Monday. Thanks.